Join me right now is UFC welterweight Alex Morono. What's going on, Alex? Well, nothing much, man. Happy to be uh, happy to be fighting again so soon. Yo, I'm happy to see you back into the cage, man. Uh, let's start off first about your commentating gig at Fury Fighting. You know, you got guys like Bizping, Cruz, DC. They're all transitioning well into that type of role. Do you see yourself doing the same down the road? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, it'd be cool for the UFC, but I know they have to travel so much. Man, I'm a, I'm a homebody very much so. Like, I own and run a, a very successful martial arts gym that's been around for over a decade. So I spend every evening there. I love being at that gym. But, uh, but no, I really enjoy doing the commentary. I've done a few, like, fight-to-win submission-only matches and a few of the Fury cards. If there's anything I can do is talk MMA or talk jiu-jitsu. So I do enjoy it more than anything else. If I ever get paid for it, that'd be awesome. But uh, yeah, I was. Everyone always says I would do well in that setting because I teach classes a lot to like thirty people, so I have no problem talking in front of like groups or, or people. So, so yeah, I'd love to do that. All right, let's get into your last fight, UFC Beijing. You took on the hometown guy. You beat him convincingly. How do you assess the performance you had? Uh, that was good. I hit man. It was weird. I hit him with some shots, and uh, they didn't seem to phase him. It made him bleed. But, like, they didn't ever really stagger him, and I figured as much. So I, I, I've had fights in the past where I tried to get, like, one-punch knockouts, and it didn't come, and it's, like, a little, like, jarring on the game plan. On this one, my, my plan was to just do damage, do as much damage as possible in three rounds, and that mindset really helped out a lot. But uh, <clears throat> the plan was if I could not outstrike him, because he's a good striker. I didn't know how good his striking would be. If I couldn't outstrike him, was to wrestle and then grapple with him, but I did not have to do that. I was very happy. I'd much prefer to strike anyway. So the game plan went like my RA plan worked and the punches landed. I, I didn't really get hit with anything until the third round. It was a good fight. What were kind of the minor adjustments you made like mid-fight to kind of get the win convincingly? So, I mean, I always train and try not to brawl. And I didn't brawl too much, but I have a really good way to like roll punches and counter punch at the same time. And I remember there was an exchange in the first and then a big one in the second where he threw like six or seven shots and they all missed and I counter punched every single one of them. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the plan was to come forward more than normal and again, just like do damage. And after I saw him bleeding pretty good after the first, I knew I could keep that, that pace and that trend going. But to his credit, in the third round, he actually hit me with an elbow on my nose and I didn't know it happened until I watched the fight after. I thought it was a punch. And uh, so I had to let my, like, nose harden back up. But until, like, that midway point of the third round and the eye poke, I really had no damage done whatsoever. It was a pretty easy fight to, like, stay calm and do the game plan and just do damage. I was very happy with that fight, especially considering the trip was, tr trip was tough. It was a long trip. Our flights were delayed. Our bags got lost. It was on Thanksgiving. Like, there was a lot going against us, and we came out very victorious. Yeah, this wasn't your first trip to Asia. You fought in Japan a little over a year before that fight. What did yeah. you take away from that trip to allow you to better acclimate yourself to Asia? So I knew the time change wouldn't hurt. So, you know, we show up there on a Tuesday and then we fight on a Saturday. And, you know, like when you're in a different country, you always go out to eat and go sightseeing. And when it's fight week, you don't do that. So I was pretty much in the hotel the whole time, just like sleeping when I needed to. So I got used to the time change very fast. And uh, I'll tell you, I really enjoyed Japan. I would surely go back to Japan. I, I enjoyed the, uh, just the culture. And, and the food and everything there. Ch China was okay. Not as cool as Japan. But uh, it's cool. I always wanted to go to Asia. I definitely plan on going to Thailand, most likely after my run in the UFC, so I can get a Thai fight up there. But uh, but that'd be a really cool place to go visit as well. But Asia's awesome. I just married a Filipino lady a couple of weeks ago. Oh, no doubt. Uh, yeah. Hey, <laughs> no hate on China, but, you know, most people, when you talk to them, and they visited China or Japan, or they both visited both places, they usually prefer Japan. I, there's, I guess there's some unique aspects of Japan that people enjoy. So, yeah, Japan was really cool and accommodating. And I don't want to say anything, like, mean about China, but mm -hmm. I don't have many nice things to say either. But Japan well, was awesome. We, we were some yeah, super you know. cool people. It was awesome. Well, now... When you were there, you fought in front of the Asian audience. When you compare it to them to the stateside audience, what are the big differences? 
Um, you know, it wasn't, it, they were, they were loud and uh, I was in the back and there were a lot of Chinese flatter on that card and they were really giving support to their, to their countrymen and, 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 and ladies, which was really cool, but they weren't, they weren't rude. They weren't just like, it was the fight night was always fun. Like I've never been booed. I fought a Canadian in Canada, a Japanese guy in Japan and a Chinese guy in China and have been like greeted with nothing but respect. It was really cool. I've never had a bad experience. I know though, if I ever go to Brazil and I fight a Brazilian guy, they're not going to be so friendly. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure that's going to happen one day. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, you finally get the contract to fight Zach Otto. You guys have been calling each other out, I guess. Um, is there a, a, some underlying beef there? No, for whatever reason. And, man, he's going to regret this because he uh, he doesn't like to brawl. He does not like to get hit. And, like, that's, that's the main thing I try to do is just get into gunfights and firefights in these fights. I'd never asked for this fight. He asked for this fight. And then it didn't happen. And then he got another fight. He fought Sage. And then he asked for it again. And we didn't get it. And, like, I've asked for certain fights in the UFC. And as soon as I don't get them, I move on. And, like, I'll, I'll either fight whoever they offer or I'll show, shoot out a different name. But he just, like, stayed on it for so long. And I think it's because he watched my Jordan Mean fight. And he saw me get, like, beat with some lay and prey. But that was a unique fight. I had trained for that fight for a very long time. And I, I really thought, and more than like thinking, I wanted that fight to be like a glorious kickboxing match, and it wasn't. And I just like never accepted the different game plan to grapple. I didn't really want to grapple, and like it just caused me to freeze up. But I, I never really dealt with that before. But I fought wrestlers and grapplers, and instantly get up to my feet and then land some punches. So I think he he wanted the fight because he thinks it's going to be easy. But man, I've been training at Fortis MMA in Dallas, and like the pace there is as high as it could ever be. And uh, cardio's on point, weight's on point. He needs to expect, like, a really ugly, very bloody fight. And if he thinks it's going to be easy, he's he's going to have a really rough night. Like, I 100% plan on finishing him with punches. I don't think that's a surprise for anybody. Fortis MMA, the team that has been assembled there, is nothing short of spectacular. How did you end up with that Dallas-based team? So, you know, I live in Houston. It's about a three-hour drive. I make that drive every single week when I'm in camp. But uh, a, a really good friend of mine, his name is Cameron Graves. He's 7-2 and two as a pro. He, uh, he had met them previously, and I went up with him one week. Uh, this was before the Jordan Mean fight. And uh, the team is amazing. The guys are awesome. I've known a lot of those guys for a while on, like, the, the, the Houston scene and just, like, the legacy scene. But it's the coach there. His name's Safe Saud. He's uh, Coach Safe, man. He's, like, an evil genius. I don't know why I've never wanted to make someone more proud in a fight. Like I've never wanted to get a knockout for somebody else any more than, than just like for this coach, man. He, he like really puts in some serious effort in coaching. He just like rallies the troops so well. He motivates it so well. He's going to be in my corner for the first time for this fight. And it's just such a perfect sacrifice for me to try to go, you know, take auto soul. That'll be awesome. You seems like you've been splitting your training camp at home and then going to Fortis. Who are some of your training partners that you've been working closely with? So, uh, so I go to Fortis for every Monday and Tuesday. We do like a really good grappling day, like you know, just like get up drills, wrestling drills, you know, hard MMA grappling on Mondays. And then we do like a, a hard sparring and MMA work on Tuesday nights. Then I drive home, and then in Houston, that's where I do all of my pad work, all of my jujitsu drilling, and then I do get quite a bit of sparring back home. I cross train with the guys at Team Tooks. That's where Cameron's from, and then the guys at Four Ounce. So Daniel Pineda is probably the best fighter who's not in the UFC in Texas and like, you know, it'd be, it'd be stretching to say like in the world, but man, he's so good. He, he's a 45er man. He's just his, the way he wrestles and strikes and just controls and does damage. He, he needs to go back in the UFC. That guy's a, a really good training partner. And there's just a bunch of guys all around town. I go to maybe like five or six different gyms around town in Houston and get my work in there. I do strength and conditioning with, uh, with my guy, Adam Latiti. He's uh, an ex pro rugby player who does a purple belt in jujitsu. So he knows what I have to go through. So I do like all like my technical work, my drilling, my strength and conditioning back home, and then I do like my pacing work and my MMA game planning at Fortis. It's such a good blend. It's like a technical blend with a really high pace, and I've never felt better for fights. You know, I've had a lot of fight camps too. Has there have you added anything new to it? Because it seems like you know you got so much going on in your camp. Uh, no, I've been doing this full time since I don't even know. It's been so long. It's when I'm not in fight camp, I feel incomplete, like, as a person. Like, when I'm in fight camp, you know, like, diet stays strict and clean. All my extracurricular stuff's kind of out the window. I just train my butt off. The business, like, picks up because everyone trains hard. Like, everything seems to run smooth when I'm in camp. Like, everything seems complete when I'm in camp. 
and uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, if anything, I'm just like adding more, like the strength and conditioning I've added in. I've been doing that for about a year solid now, and, and see and feel a big difference. Of course, going up with the Fortis guys consistently is awesome. So, uh, so yeah, I've added some in and dialed some back. Like I don't spar as much, but the times I do spar, we make it count. Like especially at Fortis, like when we get our rounds in, like you get conditioned for a fight. Nothing is going to be as hard as the training there. The fights are nothing compared to the training. It's awesome. Looking at your opponent, when you break him down, what is your assessment? <clears throat> you know what? When I first took the fight, before I watched all the tape, I thought he was like a wrestler. But that's actually not quite the case. He doesn't shoot as much as I think. I do think he's going to try to wrestle with me and, and hold me down. You know, it's kind of like prepare for the worst, hope for the best. I'm preparing to get laid on, but I'm hoping he'll stand and trade. And he actually does stand and strike, but he doesn't super commit to his shots. He kind of throws for, like, uh, activity, doesn't engage in a lot of gunfights. So I'm just going to try to make him really uncomfortable in this fight and stay in his face and do some damage. And, you know, I have no problem grappling with him, especially since it's, like, in my mindset now. So I feel like I have a lot of freedom in this fight, and I, I feel like he's going to have to like look for some desperation takedowns because he's not react very well to getting hit, and that's not something you can train either. So, I mean, I, I think he knows I'm going to be coming at him really hard, So and that's what's going to happen. When you analyze you guys, you guys are the same height, you're the same weight class, you have the same reach, you have the same lead hand, but what separates you the most from him? So this is my personal opinion, and I don't like him very much. This may be biased, but, like, you know, I think he's, like, an athlete. He, he's, like, a martial artist, but he's not a fighter. Like, when I fight, I go in there, like, ready to die to kill somebody. You know what I mean? Like, I'm in there to, to, to throw down, you know, and, and not look back. And, and he just doesn't seem to have that same grit. And I'm not going to say he's not tough, but he definitely doesn't seem to be about it. He seems like the kind of guy who, like, athletically made his way through. But, like, you know, when the cards are down... I'm going to be the one, you know, swing until the end. And I don't think he's he's that same way. Yeah, I remember your debut. Your debut, like, you shocked a lot of people in that fight. And that is the definition of what you're just talking about right now is that grit, man, that you bring. It's awesome. Um, now, you get through auto in Wichita. What do you see for yourself for the rest of the year? You know, I don't know. If I could fight three times this year like I did last year, that would be awesome. Um... I would fight once a month if they let me, but booking's kind of tricky. Honestly, like as soon as the new year started, I set some pretty cool goals with like strength and conditioning and like dieting and just like healthy lifestyle. And I had a hunch I'd be fighting in March. So I started fight camp like January 1st. So I've actually been training for what, six, seven weeks now. And I still have three more weeks. I mean, I'm already in shape. I can, I can, I could fight on Saturday and make weight easy. So I'm like ready to go. But I don't know. This is the final fight on my second contract. You know, I plan on getting a finish and then re-signing. And I'm just very happy to be in the UFC. There's a million guys I'd fight. I'll I'll really look at that after the fight. But uh, but I'm I'm not too sure yet. We'll see. We'll see what happens. You just mentioned that it's your last fight in your second contract. Was this a conscious thing that you are doing that you're just gonna fight out your contract, or is it something that you know that the UFC decided? Yeah, I, I'm not too sure how much information should be shared there, mm -hmm. but I, I'm in a very similar kind of like swing on my first deal as well. If I, I think if I had put Jordan Mean away and then won this Keenan fight, they could have re-signed me, but it, it wasn't anything immediate, and if I had to choose between fighting out my contract or waiting to get re-signed and then fight later, I would have fought now anyway. So this is, if anything, it's more of a just like a way to keep things rolling because you know i'm 28 I, I feel like i have another maybe like seven or eight good years of fighting i want to maximize my time like if i'm not if i'm not fighting you know now i want to be fighting soon so you know ideally get this fight get this win recover and then fight in another three months Definitely. but i'm more than confident they, they'll they'll resign me even with a i'm not even, you know i don't i'm not gonna lose this guy but but i think even after that they'd be willing to, like, work. I, Sean Shelby's awesome. He's always giving me good opportunities. I've actually taken quite a few short-notice fights that did not go through. There were three separate occasions where guys backed out, I took the spot, and then just something went wrong. And I know they enjoy the fact that I'm willing to, to go fight. I also, also always stay in shape. I'm not a very big welterweight. Cutting weight's not hard. So, so we'll see. When you look at the welterweight division, you got Woodley facing Usman. Who do you see coming out in that fight? Because this is an interesting matchup right here. 
Jeez, man. I uh, I was never a big fan of Woodley because he's a wrestler, and I'm way less a fan of Usman. But Woodley's put some finishes together, and he doesn't complain so much anymore or play the victim card. I'm really rooting for Woodley to win. He's becoming a good champ. He's defending his belt. He's fighting regularly. I don't know why Colby didn't get the fight. That that Any one of those matchups would have been good. At least Colby's act, active when he fights. But I think Woodley's the better striker than Usman. I don't like Usman's mentality, his attitude, and his style of fighting sucks. I hope Woodley finishes him, and I think he will. He's had a way, he's had a way more experience fighting in, in the big show. You know, like the big, the big five-round title fights. So that's a fun fight card. That's what next weekend, huh? Not this weekend, but next weekend. Maybe, maybe two weekends later. Yeah. But uh, that's a fun fight card. And another guy in the news a lot is the interim champ, or former interim champ, which is uh, Colby Covington. What are your thoughts on his situation? You know, he kind of got left out in the cold, and so, and the UFC seems like they're saying that he did it to himself. What do you think? Yeah, he's a he's an anomaly. I think he thinks he's got a bunch of fans, but I'm an MMA fan. The only reason I'm in the UFC is because I was a fan, and I was like a, a, a fat teenager who didn't have any martial arts or athletic training. I just started training because the UFC was cool and have just had enough discipline to train a lot and fight a lot, and now I love it. So like, I, I like the fan questions because I am an MMA fan. Extreme sports bring extreme fans. And he made a post like looking for sympathy, and he was like, I may never fight in the UFC again, and everyone was like, oh, good. That's nice to, to be rid of him because he's so weird with, with how mean he is and everything so i don't know i think he should have surely gotten the title fight and there's just some things you don't pass up on you don't pass up on ufc gold like i mean i don't know if he had an injury or whatever but so my my ufc debut i don't know i had a very torn acl for that fight there were a couple times i threw some right hands and just kind of fell over but uh dude when they offered that fight without hesitation i took it and i got my knee fixed afterwards like i don't know in, in my opinion and granted i know i'm not you know ranked top 10 or anything or offered title fights but i would never pass any of that up so there's, I, I don't know, Colby. He's fun to watch. He's got a good. I can't believe he beat Damian Maya like he did. Who else did he beat? Uh, did he fight Dos Anjos, Rafael Dos Anjos? Yes. yes. Beat him up pretty bad too. Yeah. I didn't see that coming either. So I mean, Colby's good. He's a good fighter, but just the the way he promotes himself is very strange. Those uh promotionals that he does. Do you see? Have you seen those with the girls? Like, you know? <laughs> like no, like the bully bash or whatever. No, no, even, no, after that, he did some, like, bookie advertisements, and he got the girls. Oh, no. oh you ever seen those? All right. I, I, I'll, I recommend I'll check them the out. Matters. Yeah, okay, check them out. Yeah. yeah <laughs> all right, one last thing guys. before I let you go. Uh, I see, I speak to fighters from all over the world, you know, all walks of life. You know, what? what is on your playlist currently when, you know, you're riding around in your car, getting to the, you know, getting ready for training, or just hanging out? What's on your playlist? What can you recommend me to go check out? Oh, that's a fun question. And like metal fans are so kind of few and far between. I actually met my favorite band of all time in Sephirum. They're from uh, Helsinki, Finland. And uh, and I they came to Houston. I actually got to go backstage and meet them. But I listen to a lot of metal. I Even in and out of fight camp, pretty much only listen to metal. But Amon Amarth, do you know the band Amon Amarth? No. Oh, they're very heavy. They sing pretty much all about like like the lifestyle of Vikings, like being prepared to die in fights. Like there's one song called Free Will Sacrifice where like they're choosing to go out to this battle. They know they're going to die in, but they choose to do it anyway. So man, as the fight camp gets closer, I uh, there's I have, like an insatiable like lust for heavier and heavier metal. So a band called Ensephirum, a band called Winter Sun, or a band Amon Amarth. They're all really good like melodic death metal. And that's all I listen to all the time. My gym listens to that music a lot too. Not by choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, March 9th, US, UFC on ESPN Plus 4. You're taking on Zach Otto. Thank you for your time, and uh, good luck to you, Alex. Cool. Thanks a lot, man.